So amen. If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, or maybe you're using a device, let me invite you to take it out and turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. We continue our journey through this letter written by the Apostle John to the first century church, and uh, John is the last, we believe, living apostle at the time, and he's writing to a fragile church of young believers who have been persecuted both from within, from wolves who have come into the church, and being persecuted externally as Rome begins to grow its heat towards the Christian community. And so it's a very fitting book for us to read as just, what does it look like? And, and in 1 John chapter 4, he's, he's telling us about the love of God. But while you're turning there, I want to give you a special announcement. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to gather in this room, and then we're going to go over together as a group to our worship center that's being remodeled. And you'll have an opportunity, if you'd like to join us, to travel over at 6 o'clock, uh, and we're going to have an opportunity to sing a song or two together, to read some scripture, to pray, and then you'll have an opportunity to write on the wall of the worship center. You remember when you were a kid and got in trouble for writing in the hymnal at church? Well, you're going to have permission to write on the wall at church. What a glorious day this is, right? We want you to come, and you can write a, a, maybe your favorite verse, uh, maybe a lyric to a song, uh, you can write something that's uplifting, but we want to set aside some time uh, to just declare together, this is the house of the Lord, and we're going to worship him, and we want the nations to know him uh, through the work of the church. And so uh, to do that, I thought I would just give you a couple of the pictures to kind of update you. Here's the new carpet that's going in. We're excited about that. And uh, I'm just kidding. That's when it was moved out. That's when the deacons moved all the chairs over here for you to sit in. Uh, and then, uh, so the, the progress has come. It's come slowly at times. But it's coming, so they begin to remove things and take stuff out and uh, haul things away. And then we begin to pull down some of the ceiling in order to put in the new sound equipment and some new sound uh, places. And I want you to see the picture of this stage for just a second because I want you to know something. The stairs, the floor, and the risers that the choir was on was all concrete. So for four weeks... We came into the office, and we left from the office listening to a jackhammer. Four weeks to get all, they would bust it up in pieces and wheelbarrow it out. God bless them, right? For four weeks. So they got the stage out, they got the, that out, they began to build back the stage in a different shape and form. Hopefully this will help some of the sight lines, you'll be able to see better because of the angles of the stage. You can see the walls going up, for those of you that have been around here for a while, the, the sound booth and the little crow's nest. That's all gone there to give us some more space in the room. Uh, and so you can see what's happening. And so tonight at 6, we're going to start by gathering in here. So we get everybody gathered up. Then we'll walk over together, fill the room. There's no chairs. There's no air condition, right? So we're, so we're not trying to stay over there for two hours. Uh, we can do that in here today. So I hope you got your Bible. But uh, we, we'll go over. We'll go over. Uh, we'll sing together. We'll read some scripture. And then we'll give you an opportunity to just pray. Hope, put your hand on the wall and pray and write, and just uh, be encouraged by what God's going to do through that room. And we know, brothers and sisters, the church is not an address. It is not a room. If the Lord saw fit to burn it to the ground tomorrow, we would still gather and praise his name. But it is nice to have an address and a place together. We have been thoroughly blessed, and we want to just have some time to do that there. And I'll make one more caveat announcement. You will write on the wall we tell you to write on. Because some of the sheetrock's already been put up, and we don't need John was here on that wall, all right? That, that won't go well. All right, you're at 1 John chapter 4, and John was writing to the church, and oftentimes when we say the love chapter, we usually think about 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes this beautiful poetic chapter about love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not boast, it is not arrogant, it hopes all things, it believes all things, it endures all things. It's a beautiful chapter on love, and that's true. That's the, the chapter where we draw ourselves into this idea of love. But 1 John chapter 4 is really a love chapter about the love of God towards us. John, in 1 John chapter 4, will tell us in the first couple of verses we saw last week, that the very definition of love is God. That God gives love its definition. And this is seen in how he sent his son to die for us. That we only know love because of God. And now, beginning in verse 13, he will begin to tell the church the benefits of God's love. 
what God's effectual love towards us produces, what it does, how, how his love changes us. It's not just love by definition, it's love by action, and the action of God's love has done something for us. It benefits us. God loves us. So, so John will tell us in this chapter about the wonderful love of God, and we will see just how much God loves us. Let me show you what I mean. Look there in your Bible. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know that to believe the love of God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, we are also in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And This is the commandment we have heard from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, would you just remind us again, Lord, from the beauty of your text, from the truth of this sufficient scripture, just how much you love us. Father, we are a mess. We are needy and broken, sinful and rebellious. And we can sometimes certainly feel like you are far away or we can feel shame and sorrow and think you don't love us or, or maybe it hasn't gone the way we thought it would go and we doubt your love. And, and so, Lord, I just pray this morning that everyone under the sound of my voice, whether in this room or, or watching online, that, that not Corey but your Scripture would tell them you love them. You love us. And whatever feeble definition of love we could even muster, it's far greater. You love us. Lord, would you show us your wonderful love again today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first part of this chapter, he will give us the definition of love, and now he will give us the effects of love, this wonderful love. And so, John will help us see that there are kind of three effects of God's love towards us. It does some things to us, and I want to give them to you this morning. Number one, the wonderful love of God draws us into his family. The wonderful love of God draws us into his family. We are part of God's family because of his love towards us. We are not a part of God's family because we're awesome. We are not a part of God's family because we are good and righteous and holy. We are not a part of God's family because we earned it or we paid for it or we bribed him in some way. We are a part of God's family because he loves us. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 13. He says in verse 13, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. I want you to notice something here. John, in these two verses, introduces to us again the triune God. He will tell us that God in three persons loves us. We are to take away from this very clearly that God loves us totally, wholly, with all of his being. There is no love of God held back from us. He loves us so much, notice the words that he uses, that he gave us his spirit and sent us his son. Both of those are unmerited actions by God on high. God the Father, the one God in three persons, loves us in such a way that he gave us his spirit and sent us his son. Now, if you ever doubt that God loves you, just read 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Because God gave you his spirit and sent you his son, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he would want to draw you into his uh, family, that he would want to give you. No, notice the word that he uses in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him. The word abide means to live with him. 
We are of him. We are with him. We are a part of his family. We are in his clan. We walk with God, and God walks with us because he loves us. And he loves us because he sent his spirit. He gave his spirit to make us in union with him. Now, let me see if I can help you understand what this means. Prior to your salvation, prior to you being saved, becoming a Christian, and some of you here this morning might be a pre-Christian. You're not a Christian yet. Praise be to God, you can hear the gospel today and be saved. So stay with me so that you'll know. But before you become a Christian, the Bible says that you are a sinner separated from God and that your heart is a heart of stone that is rebellious to God. And that the judgment of God is on your shoulders. That you will spend eternity separated from God in hell because of your sin. And something has to be done. And that something is that God, in his great love and mercy, sent his son into the world to die on a cross, to take our sins, to be buried, from the buried in the grave, to raise from the dead, and now give us a way of salvation by trusting in him and him alone. But just knowledge of that will not save you. Factual knowledge of Jesus does not save you. There are many scholars who believe in the factual knowledge of Jesus. There are demons who believe in the factual knowledge of Jesus. But they are not saved. They are not Christians. And the reason why they are not saved is not because their brain doesn't know the history of a man who lived 2,000 years ago and died and was buried and rose from the grave. It's because their heart has not been convicted, changed, or reconciled by the gift of the Holy Spirit. So notice what he does. Look there in verse 13. It says, he loves you because he abides in you and you in him because he has given you his spirit. The spirit of God convicts us of our sin. The spirit of God shows us that Christ is the Savior. In fact, Christ, as the Apostle Paul would say, is foolishness to the world. I mean, think about the Christian doctrine. We believe that we are made right with God because he sent his only son to die on a cross 2,000 years ago, be buried and raised from the dead. That's crazy to the world around us. That's crazy to the one who sees with physical eyes and not spiritual eyes. But the Spirit of God convicts us of our sin. The Spirit of God illuminates for us the truth of the Scripture. The Spirit of God draws us to see Christ as the Savior. The Spirit of God affectionately calls us and by faith, we respond and are saved. We respond by confessing Christ and believing in him and the Holy Spirit moves into our life and now we are the children of God. Our DNA has been changed. We've been changed from a dead man walking with Satan and the God of this world to a living man that will never die but be with Christ forever. We are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 36, God will replace our heart of stone with a heart of flesh that beats for him. This is why, brothers and sisters, when we speak of salvation, we do not brag on ourselves. We do not speak about our merits. We do not talk about our faithfulness. We talk about a loving God who sent his son to die for us and his spirit to call us, and we responded in faith, and we are saved. It is God who did this. Why? Because he loved he loves you. He loves you. How do I know he loves you? Because he sent his one and only son to die on a cross for you, and then he sent his spirit to convict you of your sin and point you to Jesus and call you to salvation, and you responded by faith. He loves you. You might say, well, pastor, if he loves me, why did I get cancer? Why did my spouse die? Why did the world fall apart? Why has it not gone the way I want it to go? Listen, we live in a broken world, and it is fallen. But if you ever spend one moment doubting the love of God, just read 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. And remember, he gave you his spirit, and he sent you his son. He loves you. He loves you. Now, we must pause here for just a moment because we need to understand something that is circulated in our culture that is just absolutely unbiblical and untrue. As Martin Lloyd-Jones would say, it is unbiblical and unfathomable and just untrue. And that is simply this. There are those who teach that you can be saved apart from the Spirit of God. That you can be saved by knowing the knowledge of Christ 
by gaining the knowledge of Christ, by confessing Christ, and then at some point in your spiritual walk, you will encounter the Holy Spirit and be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and they will teach that this is often accompanied by miraculous gifts such as healing or prophecy or speaking in tongues. And I mean no ill will towards our charismatic brothers and sisters, but I would just simply say to you that is unbiblical, untrue, and not helpful. Why? Because brothers and sisters, you would not know your sin if it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit. You would not believe in Christ if it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit. You would not trust in the Scripture if it were not for the Holy Spirit. You would not respond in faith if it were not for the work of the Spirit. And the Spirit of God is the person in the Trinity, which means when the Spirit of God convicts you and you confess and respond in faith and you cry out to Jesus and you are saved, the Spirit of God moves into your life. And the Spirit of God is a part of the triune God, a person. So you don't get part of the Spirit, half of the Spirit, a little bit of the Spirit. You either got all the Spirit or none of the Spirit because the Spirit is God himself. That's like asking a woman if she's half pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You either have him or you don't. John says, God loves you so much that he gave you his spirit. Brothers and sisters, the love of God draws us in. He pulls us in. He gives us his spirit. And now we can abide in him. We can walk with him. And notice what John says, look there. How do you get the spirit? How does the spirit come into your life? What do you have to do? What is your part? Where do you play? Well, he tells us this is where the the, the free will of man and the sovereignty of God collide. And they're not enemies. They are scripturally not enemies. Notice what he says. Listen, look at verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son. This is the third time John's used that sentence in this letter. He is an eyewitness to Jesus. He says, I have seen and I have testified. What does he say? I have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. He says, listen, this is what you need to know. God sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, I want to be very clear here. The gospel is inclusive. God sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen to what he says, whoever, whoever will come. But listen very carefully now. The gospel is inclusive. Whoever so will come, but it is exclusive that you can only come through Christ. It is inclusive. Whosoever will come, but it's inclusive. You must come through Christ. Listen to what he says. Look at the verse. Verse 14. And we have seen and testified the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So you want to be loved? You want to be drawn into the family of God? Here's what it looks like. You have the Spirit of God because you've confessed Christ and you believe him to be the Savior and God indwells in you and now you're in him and he's in you, which means he's in you. You now have the power to follow and love him and you are freed from the chains of sin and you're in him, which means you are secure no matter how you live, how you die. You are secure because God is forever holding you. And so he literally says, this is the gospel. It is inclusive. Whoever confesses the Son of God can be saved. It is exclusive. There is only one way for men to be saved, and that is through Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't say, I'm a way, and there's a couple of options. He says, I am the way. Acts 4.12, there is no other name given among men which you can be saved but Christ Jesus. There is only one way to salvation, and that's Christ. And let me just say something here to be very clear. People can say, well, that seems unfair. That doesn't seem right. Brothers and sisters, it's unfair that God would save us at all. It's unfair that a holy God would allow his only son to be crucified and have the wrath of hell poured out on him to save you and me because I know how wicked I am. I know how fallen we are. I know how broken the world is. It's not unfair that God would save us. It's a merciful gift of love. So he says, 
The wonderful love of God makes you his family. Why? Because he gives you his spirit and he sent you his son. I want you to notice a phrase that he uses. Look at verse 16. He says in verse 16 these words. He says, so we have come to know and to believe that the love of God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. He says, this is how we know love. You, you want to know if God loves you? Here's what John says. John says he loves you because he sent his spirit to change your heart. He sent his spirit to convict you of your sin and show you his son as the Savior. And he sent his son to die for you so that you might live and live in righteousness. So, so you ever have to doubt the love of God? Just remember, he sent you his spirit. He sent you his son. He loves you. He loves you. Now we must, for just a moment before we leave this text, wrestle with evangelism. We must wrestle with the lostness in the world. Because I, I, I want to be very sober-minded and clear with you, brothers and sisters. We gather in this room week after week. My task as the pastor, the elder, the teacher is to equip the saints for the work of the gospel. My job is to feed you and teach you and encourage you so that we together can leave these doors as an army for the Lord and go and share the good news of Christ. But I want you to notice something now. Look at verse 13, right? He says, he, he gave you his spirit. I look at verse 14. You get his spirit by confessing Jesus, right? 14 and 15. And that we know we abide in him when we confess and we believe. So, so let us be very clear here. There is no gray area. If one does not come to confession in Christ, they are not saved. They do not have his spirit. They have damnation on their shoulder. Hell is their destiny and the wrath of God waiting. This means, brothers and sisters, there are 3,000 people groups in the world that have never been engaged with the gospel. Over 70% of the world is less than 2% Christian, which means even the gay engagement of the gospel is low. There are hundreds of thousands of people moving to Greenville County every single day, and they don't know Jesus Christ. There are kids in your home and grandkids around the corner and spouses in the bed next to you, and they don't know Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, if you do not confess Christ, you do not have his spirit. And if you do not have his spirit, you are not abiding in him, and you will not go to heaven. And so, brothers and sisters, we must go with the good news. We must go and look at a dying world and say, Jesus loves you. God sent his son for you. God cares about you. God doesn't want you to die. And you know why you're a Christian? Because somebody told you. Oh, that it would not stop with me, that it would not stop with you, that we would go and tell someone, God loves you, and he loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you, and he wants his spirit to dwell in you, and you can abide in him, and he will abide in you, and he will bring you home. And let us be extra clear here, brothers and sisters. Just looking at someone and saying God loves you or God bless you when they sneeze is not the gospel. John says in verse 14 and 15, you must believe that the Father sent him and confess with your mouth. You must confess. Notice that verse there in verse 15. He says, confess. It's a personal confession. So let me ask you this morning before we leave the safety of this room. Have you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you come to the knowledge that Christ came and died and was buried and rose from the grave? You will not enter into heaven because your mama confessed Christ, your grandmother confessed Christ. You will not enter into heaven because you were baptized at six or you walked an aisle. You will not enter into heaven because you grew up in a church that went, or grew up in a family that went to church. You will only enter into heaven, according to 1 John, if you confess that God sent his son for you. Brothers and sisters, let us have a passion to know the gospel and share it. We have been rescued. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul says he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of life by his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. We were in darkness, now we're in light. We were in death, now we're in life. Why? Because Jesus came. Because his spirit dwells in you. Because God loves you. But we must go with this message. I will finish this point by simply saying the theologian and pastor Carl F.H. Henry writes it this way. He says, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. 
and the world's running out of time. I don't know when the Lord will return, but I know it's closer than it was yesterday. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. I can spend hours upon hours talking about fishing and golf and hunting and the weather and politicians, and my neighbor's going to go to hell. We're running out of time. Oh, brothers and sisters, that we would have a burden for the lost, that we would have a burden for those to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The love of wonderful love of God draws us into his family. And number two, the wonderful, there's only seven points, by the way. The wonderful love of God, the, the wonderful love of God delivers us from fear. N- notice what I said, or notice the text here. Look at verse um, 17. He says, by this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For the fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Now just think about what John is doing. He's writing to a church that's been ravished by false teachers They're being persecuted by Rome. The Jews hate them. Rome hates them. Their leaders have have stumbled into false teaching. They are a fragile church, and fear is all around them. Everywhere they turn, they could be afraid. And one of the areas in which they are afraid, or they're worried about fear is, are they following the right path? Are they going the right way? Every so often, they will do surveys of people to list fears. The most common fears are public speaking, spiders, right, and death. Like those are usually the most common. Mine is my kids won't move out one day, but they're the most common, right? Those are the most common fears, right? And, 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 and those are good and, and they're understandable, but, but I just want to be kind of morbid for a minute. So just lean in with me. You're going to die. I'm going to die. And if I don't die naturally, the Lord's going to return and I'm going to see him face to face. And so th- there is coming a moment, either by death or, or the final judgment of God, which John is speaking of here, where, where every single person from Adam and Eve to the last one born will be gathered before the Lord and he will dole out his justice and righteousness and wrath and he will judge based on his holiness and his law and his goodness. And the only answer for that is Christ because we are not holy, we are not right, we are not just, we are not good. So the only answer we will have on that day is Jesus. That's the answer. That's the glorious good news of the gospel. But here's what John says. John says, if you're marching towards death or you're looking towards the day of the Lord and it scares you, then you've not met Jesus. Because if you've met Jesus, the Spirit of God dwells within you and love runs punishment out the woods, right? Run, or love runs punishment away. And he says, you do not have to fear the day of judgment. Why? Just think about the argument that he's making. God saved you through his son. He put his spirit inside of you. You now have the DNA of God. You are in the family of God. You are an heir of Jesus. You are a brother to the Lord's family. So on the day of judgment, all he's going to do is look at you and say, daughter, son, your room's ready. Come on in. I mean, this is what Jesus says, John 14. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I am coming again so that you may be where I am also. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen, I don't care if my room's in the front or the back or the guard shed by the gate. The Lord has made a place for me. He's made a place for me, so I don't have to fear. Now, let us be clear. Let us be clear. I am not saying that on your deathbed or that 17th treatment, or that sickening disease of dementia, you begin to fail. I'm not saying there isn't room for fear. I certainly don't want to fear the pain of death or, or experience the pain. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that a believer that knows that Christ's spirit is in them and Jesus is the answer to death has no fear in death. So he literally says, when you experience the love of God, The very fear of slavery of death is broken. It's broken. It's gone. Now, I I, I want to die falling asleep in my recliner, eating bluebell ice cream, watching Andy Griffin. That seems like the best way to go, does it not? 
I'm from Alabama, R.C. Cole and a moon pie, right there on the spot. But I, I don't know how I will die. It could be painful, it could be horrific, it could be many centuries from now, it could be before this sermon is done. I don't know. But I know this. Jesus Christ died for me and rose from the grave to defeat death. The spirit of the living God lives within me. And so therefore, not because of me or my ability or my strength or my faith, but because of Jesus, I don't have to fear whatever that death looks like. This is why we sing no guilt in life, no fear in death. Because of Jesus. So he literally says the, the love of God dispels fear. Why? Because notice what he says. Verse 18, therefore no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Because I'm a child of the king, because Christ has saved me, because his spirit dwells within me, I'm not going to heaven for punishment. I'm going to heaven for a family reunion. I'm going for the marriage supper of the lamb where we feast and never grow full. Praise be to God. I'm not afraid. I don't have to be in fear. We once stood in fear of God because he judged over us. Now we stand in awe of God because he loves us. He says, this is the love of God. Finally, John, who is, a, I think, the prototype of a Baptist pastor, gives us three points. And the third point is application-driven. He will say, if you've experienced the love of God, then he will draw you into his family and he will, he will dispel any fear that you might have, but then that love compels us to action. He will finish the sermon, he will finish the text by telling us that the overwhelming love of God demands that we love the fellowship. L let me show you what I mean. He, he ends with application. He says in verse 20, if anyone says, I love God, so now just, just, just think about it. He's laid out the love of God and he says, I, I love the Lord I love the Lord because he sent his son, he sent his spirit, and he's cast out fear. If you're claiming that, this is what he says you will do. He says, I love God, hates his brother as he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. He literally says, if the love of God that sent his son and gave you his spirit and cast out the fear of death. If that love's really gripped your heart, you will love the body of Christ. You will love the church, the people of God, other Christians, folks on the narrow way. You will love the body of Christ. If you don't have a commitment or a love for the family of God, it might be evidence you're not a part of the family of God. He, he gives us this litmus test. He says, you want to know if you've experienced the love of God? One, have you confessed Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God changed your heart? Two, have you dispelled the fear of death and judgment? And three, do you have a love for the family of God? Do you have a love for the people of God? He says, if anyone says, but then hates his brother, he's a liar. Now, as I was studying this week, these verses didn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot to explain it. It's pretty plain in the English. If you say, I love God, and you don't care about the people of God, you don't love God. It, John's not beating around the bush. He's not, he's not sugarcoating it. He's just simply saying, don't, don't walk around with that hypocrisy, because that doesn't look like a transformed life. So that if you love God, you'll love the people of God. Why? Because the people of God have the same spirit dwelling in them, and we're going to spend eternity together. We're going to spend eternity together. This is a, a running start to eternity. We're going to be together. This is love. John Stott put it this way. He said, it is obviously easier to love and serve a visible man than an invisible God. And if we fail the easier task, it is absurd to claim we are succeeding at the harder one. It's easier to love the guy sitting next to me than a God I can't see. But if I'm not loving the guy sitting next to me, I'm not loving the God I can't see. The application is that we will love those around. The visual expression of love for God is love for the church, the people of God, this way. Many years ago, around the 1900s, the turn of the century there, the, uh, the hymn was written, and the hymn was called The Love of God. I just want you to hear the lyrics of this hymn. It says, To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, Throw stretch from sky to sky. 
The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Could we think with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe betrayed? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole through stretched from sky to sky. The story goes that this hymn was found scratched on the wall of an insane asylum. That a person who was so demented and struggling with depression, anxiety, and mental illness, in a moment of clarity, all they could write was, God loves me. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of cancer and death and sickness and sorrow and mistreatment and a broken world and bad politicians and wars and guns and divorce and sorrow, might I just say this to you? God loves you. And I know he loves you because he sent his son, he gave you his spirit, and he brought you into a family. He loves you. Would you pray with me, Father? Good morning. I'm Pastor Corey. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Man, isn't it good to be able to tune in and and join God's people in lifting his name high? Our church's desire is to offer hope and build community. And I pray this morning that you were filled with the hope of Christ as you heard God's word proclaimed. I want to personally invite you to come join us at Brushy Creek. Come see what God's doing here. Come be a part of this community of believers. Every Sunday morning, we gather to hear God's word, sing to him, offer handshakes and hot coffee and ways in which we can fellowship together in life's journey. Would you come join us? At the bottom of your screen, you'll find all the information you'll need to connect with us. I would love to meet you someday standing right here in the lobby of our building. I hope you have a great week and God bless you.